I would like to call upon stage our second speaker, Professor Farid Minhas, who needs no introduction for his topic on leadership and mental health. He is co-chairman of the Board of Advanced Studies and Research at Rawalpindi Medical University. He is founder and director of the Center for Global Mental Health Pakistan, also the director WHO Collaborating Center for Mental Health and Research. Sir, please. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. What a pleasure and delight it is for me to stand on this podium and to dedicate my talk to my late friend, Dr. Harun Rashid Chaudhary, with whom I have uh, prayers of memories and associations where I have worked with him within the country and outside the country. And ever since he left, he left a, break, a, a great mark on my DNA, which means that every lecture in Lahore starts with his name and in his dedication. Long live and God bless you, Harun. My talk on leadership is um, a series of talks that I have done over the last six months or so, and I plan to do that over the next six months or so, where I want to bring out the leadership qualities that we have seen amongst the mental health professionals in the country, analyze them, put them into a platform where we can pick out the younger, for the younger generation some lessons that our seniors have taught us. The glory of Tareens, the glory of Chaudhary's, the glory of Heather's, the immense work that Harun Saab has done, the legend as uh, uh, Heather Ali Kazi Saab was, the Maliks of uh, Balochistan, the KP uh, led by Shafiq Saab, uh, and so the other followers, the mystic mesmerizing those from uh, Professor Mufti that we have heard, Mubashars of uh, uh, Rawalpindi, those are people who have come, done their job, and gone. They are not that easy to be forgotten. We have learned, we have to learn lessons from them because those are the sons of the soil who came to this part of the world and brought up mental health to the level that we are here. And when I was choosing, Imran Heather asked me my uh, topic for my talk, I said, fine, this is the topic that I will continue to do here. And I must tell you that the last talk that I did in, uh, in Murray was mentioning five leaders, um, and I went into the details of their work that they had done. I included Professor Mubasha, Dr. Khaled Said, Dr. Atif Rahman, Dr. Saeed Farooq, uh, and Dr. Afzal Javed. I thought those are the absolute leaders of mental health that they're doing a great job. And I think I have another 15 leaders of mental health that I'm going to cover in the subsequent talks that I'm going to do. But today, I thought I will move on into some of the topics uh, like that what are the leaders of, uh, what, what are the qualities of the leader that we look for? We need to think on three other subjects. What are the academic researchers for the future that we need to produce? Um, a very delicate and disputed situation between the ethics and pharmaceutical companies, and then how do we preserve our leaders? That's my last uh, point that I'm going to talk today. Mawadad Rana and I published this editorial um, way back, about five, five to seven years back, where we spoke about the concept of leadership in mental health and the way forward. Both of us were in the prime of our uh, academic activities, and we thought at that point we needed to put the facts together, and please see um, if you can read that. Now, <clears throat> I searched 
the definitions of leaders, and I picked up a few great names from all over the world, and I thought, let's see what they look in a leader. Napoleon Bonaparte said, a leader is a dealer in hope. Um, John D. Rockefeller came up with good leadership consists in showing average people how to do work of superior people. And John of Kennedy brought in that leadership and learning are indispensable to each other. And then this quote from the CEO, he said, before you become a leader, success is all about growing yourself. After you become a leader, success is about growing others. And then <clears throat> John Gardner said that it is a process of persuasion or examples by which an individual uh, induces a group to pursue objectives held by the leader and his or her followers. And then another view came up that it is a practice of mobilizing people to tackle tough challenges and thrive. But then Eisenhower had a very interesting concept about leadership. Eisenhower said that leadership is an art of getting people to want to do what must be done. And he had three other factors associated with it. He said that it is the responsibility of the leader to figure out what must be done for the major issues and much more often than not to be right. And the second, he said that it is not about getting people want to do what must be done. It is about getting them to want to do what must be done. And lastly, Eisenhower said, this is not a science. Each one of us is gifted in different ways. And our gifts are important to multiply before the leadership becomes important. And do we think that is leadership all about ordering people to follow? Or is it ignoring the views of other people? Is that a big leader? Or is it the charisma or the charismatic personalities people have that leadership is all about? Um, is it about making profit and money and fame that leaders should, uh, should be considering? It is not about the control, ladies and gentlemen. It is about the service that the leader is known for. It is about the, not about the power. It is the empowerment that you bring to your juniors and bring to the communities that becomes important in your leadership role. We all know how to manipulate things, but is that leadership? No, leadership is not about manipulation. It's about inspiring people to get up and do what they don't know what to do based on the definitions that I've spoken to. Um, is it about people or is it about the cause? And those of us who work for a cause, those of us who work for a purpose, they are the leaders who are remembered. And is it a demand that you become a leader? Absolutely not. It is, it is a reward that your followers will give you if you have done work over the years that leadership is all about. Um, if you read, hear, or uh, talk about the levels of leadership, I think this is the best example I can give you. Uh, John Maxwell has five levels of leadership in which he talks about the first level as the position rights, where people follow you because you, they have to. The second is the permission relationship, where people follow you because they want to. And the produ uh, production results uh, at level three, people follow you because of what you have done for your organization and for your work. And then at level four, people follow because of what you have done for them. And lastly, at number five, the pinnacle of uh, respect that people follow you because you are what you represent. And what you represent are the values and the traditions that, that matters most. Leaders, in my opinion, create and they need followers. Leaders create 
and they need a change. And leaders have a rock-solid value system which provides the glue for doing the first two works. Now, <clears throat> so much about the leadership. Let's focus on the second topic, that what kind of academic psychiatrists are we thinking of producing in this country? <clears throat> now, an academic psychiatrist is a psychiatrist who deals with all the clinical responsibilities, but along with the clinical responsibilities, he has a knack to do some kind of research. What kind of research are we talking about that along with their clinical work, they are going to be the leaders of their profession and make an important contribution to teaching and training and if they would know how research translates into clinical settings, you will find academic psychiatry an interesting field. Academic psychiatrists can be from any speciality and they, they, they can do the clinical work and research and training together. And these qualities combine the roles of a clinician, but then if you read the last bullet, that the clinical knowledge and skills to ensure that the hypotheses are clinically relevant, testable, judged, and are likely in the useful new knowledge either in furthering scientific understanding of systems of relevance to the illness or the illness itself to the assessment and the treatment. And I am proposing here that we have produced brilliant psychiatrists over the years but those psychiatrists have a very little component of research that they learn over the years. I trained, I was involved in training for many years. We did the uh, research pro, uh, uh, pro, uh, pro, uh, pro, projects that our trainees had to do. What is the worth of those researches that we have done? It has lifted us so-called academics into producing five to eight papers that are required for our promotion in a government setting. And we think that by writing eight papers, we have climbed the status of the professorship in our country, and we have been the leaders to follow the destiny of the thousands of the trainees that are going to come to us. That's a fallacy and that's a mistake. Academic <coughs> uh, psychiatry is not about doing a research which you don't publish and your other people publish because they need papers for their promotion. Academic psychiatry is that look at the profile that Nazish Imran has, Google that. Look at the profile that Atif Rahman has. Look at the profile that um, Saeed Farooq has. Look at the profile of what Farooq Naim has. Look at Muhammad Ayyub and see the amount of research, the quality of research, the publication of that research. And if you would have heard them, they are talking about piloting, and going into the policy, and bringing about a change. And that is what an academic uh, career or academic psychiatry uh, is, is going to be all about. And I say here, give some examples of how people can do uh, those works in terms of the etiology, pathophysiology of psychiatric disorders which are partially understood. Diagnosis continues to be based solely upon the subjective clinical assessments and for many individuals the response to the treatment is unsatisfactory. And in, in my humble opinion, the only way is to do, change this is with the high quality research that we propose the academicians will talk about. <clears throat> now, I'm not going to go into the details, but those young minds who are sitting here and who are the future leaders of mental health, they can take a note of it, and I mentioned the biology, the psychology, and the sociology of it, which they can take up and do um, further work in this area. Now, again this question comes in that 
is there a structured training program available in country to train academics in psychiatry? And what structured research opportunities are available to early career psychiatrists? That's a question that few of us have thought and they have reached the top in terms of the academics all over the world. They make Pakistan and us proud of the fact. But my message about doing this kind of work is that we have to enlarge those experiences and our younger generation and people at the helm of the affairs have to bring in some kind of research opportunities. Uh, and I'm, I'm going to give you some examples for that and need to have um, uh, 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 programs available um, in Pakistan. Now, when you heard this morning Professor Atif Rahman talking about the universal health coverage, the research universities, do you ever imagine the amount of grants that they are talking about, the amount of power that they are talking about, the amount of resources that they are talking about? And I'm going to share a glimpse of those uh, amounts that they're talking about so that you can understand my point and, and, and uh, do that. Now, <clears throat> you see, in terms of research careers, there is something known as early stage investigators. Then there is a middle stage researcher. And then there is a late stage researcher. And I have just picked out from some of the websites here that what is the early stage investigator, they, these are the criteria that they need to give. We do research a lot in Pakistan, but we are used as a guinea pig for research. Our major grants are taken by our collaborators in United Kingdom, United States of America, and we are the laboratory or the testing site where our people are paid very little. We, when we publish that work, our people from within the country are not the lead. Look at the dynamics of all public sector hospitals and see how much grants they have brought in. If Professor Atif Rahman, Saeed Farooq, name, uh, Farooq name, and doctors like these have to change their universities, they their profile is built on how much research grants they have attracted over the years. And the research grants are the ones that bring re uh, respect and the elevation in their statuses. And this is the requirement that uh, you have for the, uh, uh, for the academics um, uh, in psychiatry. And you see the first thing is a PhD is important. How many PhDs do we have? Very few. Nazar Shimran is the latest one who has done her, completed her PhD, mashallah. But then we need at least 20 more Nazar Shimrans in this country if we want this kind of status uh, to be moved in. Now, <clears throat> look at this, what they will offer you. They offer you funding in terms of Pound sterlings, 400,000 for research expenses. That's the amount that people are talking about in the early stage career awards. And on the right side are the other expenses that people are going to, to get when they are going to be in researchers. And I'm going to give you an example, this young man. Uh, uh, he joined us in Ralpindi Medical College way back in 2006. We inducted in, into him some ingredients of research. This young boy was picked up by Atif Rahman, and Atif and I together helped him go into the research uh, 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 universe. And research universe, he went, and now, he has become the research lead at Global Mental Health Research Welcome Trust in London. With a humble beginning in 2006, this boy goes to, uh, go, goes to London to look after a money which is about 200 million pounds of researches are going to be governed by him. That's the level that if you take up your career and you go up the ladder, 
you get selected. And Atif mentioned in the morning about the uh, Human Development Foundation, Human Development Research Organization, just Google their research. Look at the impact that they have done and compare that research with any other research that has been done in the country, you will find that they are doing absolutely pioneering research. And if you look at the budgets, they are even more amazing. Some of these, uh, which is all on the websites, they, their annual earnings is about 25 crore rupees. That's the amount of research that is available. And in the tea room next, next door, before the, after the last session, Saeed Farooq has secured a grant of 4.5 million pounds from NIHR. Very, very unheard of. And look at the work that they are going to do, the research that they are going to do. They are not going to be involved with how many patients have come into the clinic today and how many ECTs they have delivered today. That's a different model altogether that these people are talking about. And I think we, as you as the leaders of future psychiatry, need to think on those lines. These are some of the grants available. And all the heads of the institutions sitting here need to look at these opportunities that are existing uh, for us to cash uh, otherwise, we will get late. Now, <clears throat> that's the quote for, for the research, that it is good to be able to see the influence of your research on the practice, on the policy, and you will always have something new and interesting to do in life. Now, let me take some water before I go on to this sensitive area. There are views, some people will not like to have a cup of tea with the pharmaceutical companies. There are few who will go to the bigger, deeper extent and they would want everything and anything. And in terms of the ethics, we have no boundaries. You and I work here in this country and when we go to sleep in the, at night, और हम अपनी अदालत में खुद पेश होते हैं तो हमें बहुत सारी चीजों का दुख होता है दुख इसलिए होता है कि मरीज को हमने देख लिया मरीज को दवाई दे दी दवाई किस तरह की दी उन्होंने कहां से ली कितने की आई उस दवाई के अंदर क्या था उससे वो ठीक हो रहे हैं कि नहीं हो रहे मुझे उस दवाई से कितना कमीशन मिल रहा है और मैं अपने आप को मरीज की मजबूरी से कितना अमीर करना चाहता हूँ दोज आर द क्वेश्चन दैट वी नीड टू थिंक हम अपने मरीजों के कितनी ई ई जीज कराते हैं हम अपने मरीजों के कितने टेस्ट कराते हैं जो सारे नॉर्मल आते हैं और हम कितने मरीजों को जो परेशानी में हमारे पास आते हैं उनको ऐसी अद्वियात लिख के देते हैं जिनका एक मरीज का एक हफ्ते का नुस्खा दस हज़ार रुपये का होता है और दस हज़ार रुपये के बाद जब वो एक मरीज़ उठ के दूसरे डॉक्टर के पास जाता है तो वो उसको कुछ दवाइयाँ लिख के देता है जो वन थर्ड की भी नहीं होती मरीज़ ठीक हो जाते हैं दोनों तरफ से पैसे ज़्यादा खर्च करके भी ठीक हो जाते हैं पैसे कम करके भी ठीक हो जाते हैं और हम में से कुछ लोग मरीज़ की इस मजबूरी से इतना फ़ायदा उठा के अपने आप को इतने इमारत के मंजिल पर ले जाते हैं कि अगर वो अपनी अदालत में खुद अपना एहतसाब करें तो शायद उनको अगले दिन नींद नहीं आएगी दिस इज़ दी लेवल ऑफ प्रैक्टिस दैट इज प्रिवेलेंट इन आर कंट्री और इफ आई डोंट टॉक अबाउट दीज थिंग्स एट दिस स्टेज ऑफ माई करियर आई थिंक मेरा ये बहुत बड़ा गुना होगा दैट आई टॉक एंड आई वॉन्ट टू ब्रिंग अप द सब्जेक्ट ऑफ एथिक्स एंड फार्मास्यूटिकल कंपनी एंड आई थिंक दे आर वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट ना वी डॉक्टर्स आर पार्ट ऑफ द होल कम्यूनिटी we cannot become angels and we cannot be doing something which nobody else is doing and for changing this we have to change the society we have to change the value system and if psychiatrists of all the mental uh, of all the health professionals will not take a lead i think we all as psychiatrists would be blamed because we look at the attitudes knowledge and information of the patient population and if we are failing to do this kind of work 
I think we are letting down a golden opportunity that God has given us. Look at some of these startling facts. Drab has registered 620 pharmaceutical companies and less than 30 are multinational, rest are national companies. The two-thirds make market share is clashed by multinationals while the national companies enjoy the remaining one-third. Um, you look at these figures that I've picked up from the sources that the value in PKR is 615 billion rupees. Translate them into dollars, it is 3.77 billion dollars that we are talking about. And if you look at the growth uh, in park rupees per year, it is 22.54 percent. That's a huge amount of money that we are stakeholders in distributing. What role are we playing in that? Are we playing a positive role or a negative role? That's absolutely uh, uh, crucial. I don't want to go into the details. These are some of the marketing gimmicks and unethical promotion that people talk about. And let me come to this basic fact. <clears throat> 310 antidepressant products available in Pakistani market. 80 plus e citalopram's are available in the country. And if you look at the different products and look at their judgment, look at the perception, look at the clinical data that is available, you'll be surprised. A man can come to you and bring you the raw product from China and give you an absolute e citalopram packed in the best of, of, the, uh, of the packing. And there are some doctors who say, well, 15% is my commission. There are some who will say, no, I will make this drug and distribute it. And there are some who will say, no, I will get my share in a very different way. So we all have our benchmarks in which we go and we interact in, in such situations. Have we ever asked about the standard of the drug, the quality of the safety profile, or the evaluative studies that have been done with these drugs? We seldom have no time to ask for those things, but I think this is a wake-up call that we need to do that. Now, <clears throat> I have been in the game of organizing conference for a very long time. First time I met Shaukat Javed Saab was at a, one of the international conferences that Mubashir Saab was organizing. And he asked me that go and look after Shaukat Saab because he's coming. And Shaukat Saab came, I met him for the first time about 30 years ago. I was involved in organizing the conferences, but the last conference that I organized was in 2001 under the leadership of Professor Mubashir. I think that conference was a tremendous, phenomenal success in different ways. But then I decided one thing, that never ever in my life I would going, I'm going to organize a conference. I was the chairman of the organizing committee, and I have plenty of opportunities after that to organize conferences, but look at the records, I never did. I never did because the guilt of organizing a conference was so tremendous that I, it took me 15 years to resolve that guilt that I won't go into that organization again because of the factors that I have alluded to, the, uh, to, to you before. And look at, I just calculated with the help of some colleagues that if we were to organize a conference today, 300 participants, what would it cost? Around 40 to 50 million rupees. My estimates may be wrong. I am not... Uh, very good at maths, but I've put down my head, and I think this is what I, I thought. Look at the amount that we will spend, and look at the output that we will get. And that's my point, that pharmaceutical companies have a kitty that they have to manage all of us. And all of us have different demands from the pharmaceutical companies. And pharmaceutical companies are pushed to the wall that they don't want to do this, they don't want to do this, they don't want to do this. 
and why can't we make a rule that who is authorized for what kind of conference for what amount of conference money that they are going to be allowed for and in a year why do we have 12 conferences the constitution of pakistan psychiatric society to my knowledge i'm not a, a very good in uh, reading papers but the constitution of pakistan psychiatric society says there would be one national conference and one international conference is that right afridi sir but is that what the practice is and if that is not the practice the pharmaceutical colleagues save that kitty because the demands are going to come from 12 people in 12 months to organize those conferences and i think that is where as pakistanis as mental health professionals uh, we we have got to look into that now here are some proposals that i have been thinking about it <clears throat> um if you read recent articles published by by doctors uh, talking about this malpractice they talk about continued medical education fund and to my knowledge every doctor that i have come across in my career has some kind of relationship with a pharmaceutical company but not everyone everyone is a corrupt in that sense so i think this is a very important relationship that we need to foster and we need to have very transparent guiding principles as to how the pharma is going to deal with the with the mental health professionals and what are the do's and what are the don'ts and i've just picked up harvard university's endowment fund and i picked this as an example that why can't we have pakistan psychiatric society endowment fund and if the endowment fund is available my proposal is stop doing conferences for 2 years get all the money into the endowment fund raise funds from other sources and follow the example what harvard is doing why can't pakistanis do we are philanthropists of the top level announce today take the leadership announce this uh, this endowment fund and i'm sure people will invest and if you see that the largest financial asset of harvard university is the endowment fund this is a perpetual source of support for the university and its mission they are the largest uh, two largest categories are they support the faculty and the students in professorships and financial aid for undergraduates graduates fellowships and student life activities and the last bullet is 2 billion dollars in the fiscal year ending june uh, june 30th 2021 contributed over a third of harvard university's operating revenue in the year that's the figure that's a benchmark that we have and it is time that the new leaders take up those initiatives those who are at the helm of the affairs at the pakistan psychiatric society and the heads of the various departments need to think in terms of creating the endowment fund um, uh, in the country my last part of the presentation was uh, <clears throat> the legends of mental health the way mufti saab delivered the mystic 40 minutes of spirituality ali mufti cannot speak like that at this stage of his career but maybe 40 years later he can and what have we done to preserve the legend who is sitting here to tell people what he knows about it and how he knows about it and how he does those things and i think my humble effort is that when i'm talking about the top 20 leaders in the country uh, in mental health i have decided that i'm going to sit down with mufti saab one day and i am going to take his digital recollections of what he has done all his life in psychiatry and that interview would be for 40 for about 4 to 6 hours and then i would have the 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 1 hour production of that a 
available so that anybody, anytime who wants to get it can go through it and see to that. And this is a kind of a mission that this team has uh, been incorporated. Um, very seldom I do things without my wife these days, so she is going to be with me and Ali Mufti is going to be with me. We three are going to be the hosts of interviewing the living legends of the country, first in the first go, ten of them, and once we have done that, we will include the other legends, and by that time, I think the traditions would have been set and there would be other leaders who would want to take up that role. But for now, for the next 10 top leaders of Pakistani mental health, um, uh, Aisha, Ali and I are going to be doing this work and Genetics has been very kind to sponsor this project uh, which we are going to kick off soon after Ramzan and their video recordings are going to be available after Ramzan and we hope that we'll be able to park these video recordings on the PPS website so that everybody uh, can read them and see them. Ladies and gentlemen, my favorite slide, the last one. And I say, leaders become great not because of their power, but because of their ability to empower others. Thank you very much.